Testing view apps uh, by me, inspired a lot by Ed, oh, God, he pronounces it Yarbra, Yarbra, I think, on his, like when, he's, when he says it in his video, it sounds like Yarbra. I, I don't know, whatever, Yarbra. Uh, so it's, it's inspired by uh, his book. I haven't read the whole thing, but I've read bits of it and the talk that he did at UCOMP that I watched on video as well as numerous articles, some of which I'll have links to in here, uh, for people who have like, migrated to Jest and uh, others who have used to uh, view test utils. So, oh yeah, it's working. All right, so, but why? Why test, right? So, uh, verify that it works, right? I mean, kind of seems obvious, but um, not to sound cliche, but don't you want a little proof in your pudding? Wow, it's so tiny on this screen, I can't really read the, the subtitles. That's all right. Uh, yeah, up-to-date documentation. So, um, show of hands, how many in here write documentation? And I don't mean comments above your methods and functions. <laughs> so one, two, three, like four people. Okay, so out of those four people, how many like writing documentation? Like sucks, right? Um, how many of you? How many of you guys keep it up to date? Like reasonably up to date, right? But how many times have you heard? Oh, we'll, we'll document that. Uh huh. Uh, so anyway, uh, so some people get really zealot about it and say, "Well, you know, your tests are one hundred percent of your documentation." I kind of disagree. I'd call myself a moderate, I guess. Uh, in that, I think that your tests are part of your documentation. And uh, one of the benefits is they do stay up to date. Uh, but a lot of times your end-to-end -end tests are done like by another team, a QA team, or you know, and there's some other code base that maybe you don't even touch. And so they'll part tell a part of the story about how things all work together that your unit tests don't really, right? Because they're units. And so I think documentation has some importance. Um, I think it also kind of depends on the size of the team, what your turnover is, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. Uh, easier debugging, for sure. Um, how many of you uh, started work on a new part of the code base or something like that that you've never dealt with before, only to find uh, methods and functions dozens of lines long uh, with ridiculous nested levels of logic <laughs> with little to no test. Anybody ever encounter something like that? Dude, it was like in 2012 or 13 is when I was working on uh, BGov. I remember encountering this module that uh, a colleague of mine wrote, and he's a, he's a good friend of mine. I still hang out with him. Um, it was, it had two methods. One was like three lines and the other one was like over 140. And there, I mean, you talk about logic, oh man, no test. So yeah, that was fun. So whenever you see something like that, or even not that extreme, um, you know, it doesn't have to be gigantic methods, but it's just a lot of untested code. What's your confidence level about making changes to it, especially if you're not really familiar with it? We're not familiar at all. Like, tell me when to stop. There's no comments. Yeah, like down here, right? Yeah, no, it really is. And it's, uh, I mean, for me personally, it makes things take a lot longer because then I sit there and I get anxiety about it. I'm like, oh, God, okay, where do I start? And, and what do I do? And, and you know, because I, I get all the way through CI, right, with all my new tests that I've added and everything, and then all of a sudden, like, you get these, these bugs coming in, right, that slipped right through the prod. And now all eyes are on you because you touched it. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, the, the person who wrote, wrote that and made the big mess, or the group of people who made the big mess, they don't work there anymore. So there's no more scapegoats. You're it. Um, so I submit that this is one of the main reasons that refactoring doesn't happen all that often. Because, yeah, like it's bad enough when you have to change it. Why would you then change it because it's a good thing to do if it's scary? And I completely agree. Uh, 
So fewer defects, right? Like the more you have tested, probably the less broken it is. Fewer, not zero. Um, yeah, as, as I already stated, and that's definitely my favorite. Less fear when editing later, or for the first time. Uh, downsides. So uh, there's a learning curve to it, right? So if you've never done testing before, and or let's say they want you to do TDD or BDD or whatever, like that's an additional learning curve on top of just learning to test. Behavioral, behavior driven development, oh, behavioral. Old. Yeah, yeah, there's like some nuanced differences depending on who you talk to, but right. Cucumber versus not cucumber, right? So, um, what else? Uh, takes additional time to write. Uh, I put my notes on the wrong slide. I have a stat for that. I think it's on the next slide anyway. <laughs> That's Google's fault. There is no, they do not offer an API to test that stuff. Um, yeah, good point. Um, but yeah, it takes uh, additional time to write, um, and it takes a different area, an additional amount of time during the deployment cycle or CI, right? Because if you're, say, doing a PR uh, model where every pull request and every change to said pull request fires off all these test suites again, like that adds up. Right, so it takes time, times however many people are doing that. You have only so many workers, you know, whether you're using Jenkins or some other CI. And yeah, that can be, it can become a bottleneck. Um, so, what else? Can make, oh yeah, can make changes refactoring uh, donning if coupled too tightly to an implementation. Um, so yeah, like over testing. Right, you're, just, you're like testing things that don't. Uh, I'm actually looking right in between you two. I'm not really sure why. I think it's because it's lighter over there. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you can over touch. You start testing for things like you don't really need to. And I find a lot of times, well, the times where I tend to see that is when people don't tend, to, one or two places where I've seen it, they either don't really have a good idea on what should I test and why, so just test all the things. Um, or uh, stemming back from when Arkov, uh, hailing back to like early uh, Rails days, uh, was all the rage. Uh, it's all about uh, code coverage, right? And you gotta, you gotta keep your, your CI build like above 95% or 97% or whatever. Didn't matter if there was no logic on those 20 lines in some file, they had to be covered, right? Um, so anyway, we've come, we've come away since then. Uh, can provide a false sense of security if not done wisely. If you don't really know what you should be testing for, what all you should be testing for, maybe you know some stuff, maybe not other stuff. Uh, you have a false sense of security about, oh yeah, everything works. Uh, so then, uh, branching off of that, why TDD, BDD? So according to a study, uh, that was done on, I think it was three Microsoft teams and one IBM team. I've got a link to it. Uh, said the results of the case studies uh, indicate across these four teams that pre-release defect density of the four products decreased between 40 and 90 percent relative to similar products that did not use the D TDD practice. Uh, subjectively, the teams experienced uh, between a 15 and 35 percent increase in initial development time after, in, uh, after adopting TDD. Um, uh, helps clarify requirements. Uh, some would say that the tests are the requirements. Uh, I would tend to agree with that for the most part. Um, Causes you to smoke, uh, to focus on smaller pieces of code at a time. And uh, for me, that's really helpful because if I'm constantly thinking about how a very complex, say, application or feature, or whatever that I'm writing, is all, all has to be strung together, um, I find that I miss things uh, when I'm down into the weeds because I'm constantly have all this other stuff uh, on my mind. <clears throat> Uh, let's see. 
uh, generally cleaner code. Uh, oh, one of the other things about uh, requirements, uh, depending on your stakeholder or your product owner, uh, they might not be especially gifted requirement authors. Uh, thinking in TDD, I don't know if that's really a phrase, but I made it up, uh, puts you in sort of the requirements mindset, whether you really think about it from that standpoint or not, it kind of is. And I found it uh, to help when trying to tease requirement clarity out of a product owner. It really has helped a lot. Uh, yeah, changes the way you think, right? So you're kind of thinking from a standpoint of what outcome do I want? And why? Uh, and I find that I tend to think less in the context of the constraints that I assume that I have. Um, it's my note on thinking. Yeah, how many of you have ever wanted, desired, wanted a drill bit? Like I used to do jobs outside where I had tons of drill bits and everything. I never actually wanted one. <laughs> no. Never wanted one. I've, I've wanted a lot of tools. I've wanted some drills. I never wanted to drill bit, right? Um, most people don't. They want holes, right? So if you concentrate on the hole, the drill bit simply becomes a tool that you might use if it's the best compromise at the time. Perhaps it'll be a CNC mill or a water jet next time. Never know. Downsides. I don't think there's much on this slide. Yeah, same study. Uh, they found it takes 15 to 35 percent longer. Um, anecdotally, from today, uh, I had to whip up that. Um, oh, yeah. Was it day picker? Yeah. No, not just any day picker, right? Because we always have to be different. Day yep. And so there it was, and I was like, uh, you know, new third-party uh, day picker component, which I actually liked. It was pretty pretty good. Uh, but then, of course, I have to wrap that in my own child component because I have this whole dropdown. And based on the dropdown, one choice is going to give you a single one, one choice is going to give you a range one, and otherwise it's going to take a simple value from the dropdown, and yada, 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 right? Um, and so I was like, well, I should walk the talk. And so I actually did. I BDD'd it. So I had five or six tests or something like that done, including snapshots, which I'll talk about before I ever actually saw it work in the browser. And so I saw all this stuff, and I'm like, OK, it should work, and then fired it up. And sure sure enough, it worked. I was like, oh, so awesome. Um, I haven't done a lot of TDD in JavaScript land. Um, I've done truckloads of it uh, in the Ruby and Rails world. Uh, let's see. Oh, there was one more. Yeah, OK, so here's one. So not necessarily the best choice for exploratory work hackathons or products where time to market is paramount. Um, I don't think there's like a real silver bullet answer for this one, other than if you've got some app, some product, or whatever, and you really have to have it out before some real world deadline, like, I don't know, launching your new iPhone or an election or something like that, then yeah, maybe it, maybe it is worth it. Um, maybe if it's just a proof of concept or something like that, perhaps it is worth it. Uh, if you're doing something like Lean Startup or whatever, maybe just do some exploratory work, just hack some stuff together or whatever, just enough to get that feedback that you need. I would say when it comes to something where you're actually going to take that and turn that into real code. Don't keep it, right? Because a lot of times they'll have, oh, yeah, we'll do the exploratory work, and then we'll come back and rewrite everything. And sometimes people do that, and sometimes, no, they don't. You know, they just sort of hack it a bit and maybe throw some tests in there. But then what they oftentimes do, I know I've done this, um, is they'll take this sort of imperfect uh, to very imperfect code and they just wind up figuring out how to test it, right? And then that's where all of a sudden it's like, my god, I'm having to mock seven things and two of them exist in some other class. It's like, well, yeah, that's a smell. All right. Testing libraries. 
Just test runner pulls all the things almost. So uh, why do I like Just? Um, because it has all the common tools built in, runner, assertions, mocks, by stubs, snapshots, uh, and code coverage, and I missed a closing paren. Um, it does not do end-to-end -end out of the box, and it does not have uh, like a headless browser. It has support for JS DOM. Performance, automatic parallel tests. Verified it yesterday, because I was reading about it, I was all right. Are you going to see it? Yep, sure enough, it does. Uh, and it is, it's fast. Uh, I actually have some outputs. Yeah, there's a, um, just give you an idea. This wasn't part of the presentation. Maybe it should have been. Uh, all right, this is going to be. No. Nope. I'm trying to get my notes up over there. fight with this for just a little bit longer and then give up. All right, I give up. Anyway, there's a, I don't remember whether it was Ed Yarberg or Evan, uh, but they did a performance comparison with uh, tape, just Mocha Webpack, Karma Mocha, and Ava. Tape is obviously the fastest, it's a little minimalist uh, framework. Uh, Mocha Webpack uh, was faster than just, uh, but Mocha Webpack uh, does not come with Karma, and what it does is it pre-compiles all your tests before it runs them. That's how it gets that speed. Uh, otherwise, uh, Jest was the fastest. Uh, it was certainly the fastest out of the ones that were uh, nearly as comprehensive as it was as far as what it offers. Um, and it seems, uh, due to the parallelization, uh, the more tests you have, kind of the more gap that, that you get between that and slower ones. Uh, minimal config. Uh, when I get into the, the code part of this, uh, you'll see there's really just not a whole ton required to get it working. Um, there's a link, I believe I also have this at the end of the presentation, uh, that I thought was a really nice comparison of uh, JS test libraries for 2018. Guy wrote it in February, and it covers pretty much all the, the main ones out there, uh, relatively in depth. Uh, view test utils. The almost stable, uh, official uh, convenience, if you want to call that library, uh, for testing view components, which is uh, what I used. I found that really easy to get going with. Uh, Viewjust, uh, single file component source mappers. So like in your output, if you get an error somewhere, like it maps it right back to uh, the exact line in your single file component. Uh, and everything's highlighted and looks like what's in your component versus your compiled uh, template and all that. Um, Flush Promises was just, it's uh, added that. It's a convenience for dealing with async uh, and promises without having to use uh, Nextech in your tests. Example. All right, let's get into code. Looks 
get out of that. My secret URL from work. Good. All right. Oh, uh, you have dash. What? It's dash. Is there a dash? No, it's not. No, I shouldn't be running. I'm not. I'm run, not running a uh, webpack dev server just yet. concentrate you know they only talk about karma um, but having talked to people in the community like you know Jess is by far the, the one that's being which must be good summer yeah all right so this is uh, it's a repo that Evan you wrote uh, as a just example I think I have a link to it um, in there if not I can put one out and so uh, since it already was doing basic the basics of what I wanted to get going, I just forked his, and so this is what he made. Um, I don't really think there's a whole lot of a point to the app as it is, but it it will let us at least demonstrate stuff, right? So, um, oh, these trackpads. Oh, never mind. It is a button. I kept thinking it was an input. Okay, so you know he's got it with a default message, and then he's got these two messages that can toggle back and forth, and then he's got a couple of list items down there. So let's look into how we're doing the tests. See, this is a little easier. All right, so we'll start with the blow that up a little bit. Start with the the list app, right? So uh, you get a prop of lists coming in, and you render them. Really, not much going on there. So. Presentation has officially disappeared. 
There we go. All right, so, uh, you know, one of the basic things is just make sure it actually does what it should do. Render an LI for each of the uh, items and propped up items. So there we have it. Uh, passing tests. Uh, and I've got a skip test in there because I got one that I commented out. So just to verify that this is actually working, let's just give it some number that we know is wrong. And you can see what that looks like. Yeah, wrong. Yeah, so what you received is two, but you expected four. And then it gives you what you actually received. Uh, pretty straightforward. Um, so the basics are uh, shell amount uh, versus mount. How many people have actually used view test utils? Okay, so just a few. Okay, so. Some of this will be just, some of it will be uh, view test utils. Uh, stop me or ask a question if you're not sure which one, because I may forget to point all the differences out. Um, shallow mount, and then there's a regular mount. That comes from view test utils. Shallow mount basically means that you're only going to mount that component and not its children. Um, and then, of course, uh, my view component. I'm going to describe it. Describe stuff is just. Um, as you can see down here, um, you create a wrapper, if you will, because that's pretty much what it does. Uh, you can still access your component right through that wrapper. It just wraps it with some, some really nice functionality. Uh, and then you can do things like this, where uh, you can pass props data in, and that will actually set your props for you. Super convenient. Uh, and then we'll do an expectation on it. The expect is just, and then uh, wrapper.findAll. Just give it uh, basic selector syntax. Uh, and then we want to know that it has uh, the length equal to the number of items that we actually passed in. And it does. Uh, the next thing would be a snapshot. So snapshot versus screenshot uh, is really just the HTML output, the rendered output. And what it does is it just saves that in a file like that. And so if you do anything that causes that to change, it's going to throw an error. And then uh, you can do, uh, what is it, npm run test dash s dash u, and it'll update it for you. Uh, if you intended to make that change, if you didn't intend to make that change, well, obviously, you have some work to do. So Uh, it's really simple to get going. You'll notice I didn't have to import anything uh, else in order to do this. Um, doing the same thing. I'm just doing the shallow mount here. Uh, actually, I could have done this const wrapper up right under the describe since it's the same in both of them. I think I did that on later ones. But uh, And then we're just saying uh, wrapper.html, which is a uh, convenience method they put uh, in there from view test utils for you. So it'll give you the uh, HTML output. Uh, and then just to match snapshot. So what it's going to do is it's going to go look here for a folder under under snapshots under under, and it's going to find the corresponding snapshot and just do a def on it. Question? Yes, sir. Uh, so that was the one I skipped. Yeah, you didn't run it. Yet. Yeah, I haven't run it yet. So actually, even though I've uncommented that part because you have the little X there. I blew it up. There we go. Now you should see that there's no longer a skipped test. Well, that one's not skipped. 
Oh, sorry. No, that one is skipped. Yeah. I am commenting it. Uh, but yeah, uh, you can just put an X in front of your it, or uh, you can use the word test interchangeably. Um, hailing, I think they got that from RSpec. I think RSpec's the first one that did that. I just mean skip that test. Brian, we have this question. Oh, yeah, yeah. When, when does the snapshot actually get taken? Like the first time you write this? Or yeah, the first time you call to match snapshot, it's going to generate one for you. Uh, from that point on, it's just a file. Um, if you do this dash u, which is the same as I think dash dash update, it'll actually. Does it tell you it did? I can't remember. Yeah, I don't see that it's. Yeah, and it's not going to be different, so it probably, it probably didn't do that. Yeah, I think I can do something like this. But we I think use, that. We use Jazz, we use the view Jazz processor or something else. So That's going to make a number of things fail, but yeah, so there you go. Two match snapshot just failed because I added an additional item, so it rendered an additional LI. And because I have that view just uh, yeah. SFC uh, mapper, uh, it gives you this nice, pretty output. So yeah, it does not match it, right? So you could say, oh, well, yeah, well, here, bet it matches now. Show enough. So I actually thought these tests were ridiculous until they saved my bacon so many times. <laughs> the snapshot thing, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Well, I think it's because you have to actually do it. Yeah, it kind of seemed a little excessive to me, too. But I'm like, mm, I think it depends. Yeah, yeah. When you use it correctly, it, 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 it's actually really useful. Yeah, right. Or if it's next person, just choose the right time to use it. Yeah, yeah so using them is new to me. I'm, I mean, I've known about them for a while, but I just started using them. Actually, for the purposes of this presentation, I've actually started to use them at work now on uh, the components that I'm testing. We'll see uh, if it saves my bacon, too. Uh, let's see. So... Find my No, it's that's not was yeah, it? That's your free zone. Look at you. Check it out. Alright. So I kinda give up on the presentation thing. I kinda like the whole like it fades in every time you click. Makes you seem like this ultra professional. Uh, presenter, but alas. Uh, so yeah, rendering uh, props, uh, match snapshot, uh, inline logic. Okay, let's do that. So which one does that? I think it's message. Yeah, all right. So in this tiny little message one, we have, hey, display the message, which is a prop. It comes in from the parent, or display this, right? So let's go to corresponding test. Yeah, so we want to know uh, that it renders uh, props up message when that's passed. So have a little message there. Again, I'm doing a shallow amount of my component. Uh, I'm passing in message as uh, my props data. And then here you'll notice uh, wrapper.text. So dot text will uh, give you the string version of the, of the output of it rather than all the markup. And then that should be message. So yeah. Now, Brian, yes, sir. Do what? No, that's something. That's a really good question, and Tracy should address that later. <laughs> no, nah, because the short answer is no. Um, the longer answer is something Tracy can talk about later, which uh, you really get 
in more into screenshots versus snapshots. Yeah, that's what we do. We're a little crazy, so we do all of them. Yeah. It's cool, though, because I can just copy your work. Yeah, actually, it also helps a lot. People screw up the CSS. Uh, yeah, and I'm one of those who just goes in and makes tests fail, just because I don't necessarily trust myself. Yeah, OK. So good. Uh, back to examples. Um, oh, yeah, this is just one more on here where uh, it's out of order with my deal, but yeah, method logic. All right, so that was inline logic. If we go back here, was it? Oh, no, sorry. Yeah, that's just the second part of it. Okay, so uh, if you don't uh, have uh, a message coming in from your props, then it should be with a whatever the default message is. And yeah, it is. Cool. Uh, manipulating state, simulating user input. It should be here. Yeah, so this one uh, is going to toggle uh, the message passed uh, whenever the button is clicked. So this gets into a little bit of you simulating uh, what a user would do. So again, we're shallow manning this component. Um, we're using a wrapper dot find again, just like we were doing in an expectation. Uh, now I'm finding it because I want to go click on it. So uh, then all you have to do is say dot trigger. Uh, list the event name, just all your common event names, uh, it will do so. Uh, and now I'm going to go find the other component that's embedded there. Um, I didn't actually do this one from the beginning, so I don't really remember what his reasoning for uh, doing a shallow mount and then importing this separately, but I, I'm guessing it just has to do with the way that the test would look. Uh, doo -doo -doo. So yeah. Uh, yeah, so we're going to search uh, props up message equal to that. Then we're going to click on uh, the button again, and then it's going to equal toggle the message. And it does. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that technically, like you could cover it in both places. Uh, you can make arguments either way. Um, what I would say is that um, I have logic here that I'd like to have unit tested so that the bug doesn't, sh you know, the, the bug will show up or get weeded out hopefully before it makes it all the way to CI, right, or QA who's testing that, um, doing the end-to-end -end tests. Um, yeah, that's. That makes sense. Yeah, if I have logic in there, I like to test it. So uh, that covers. Yeah, covers simulating user inputs, uh, method logic, because that was in a method versus inline. Uh, we got manipulating state, events, and then async stuff. So. I gotta check out a different git branch.
There we go. And leave that one. Yeah, here it is. The only one for that. Pretty simple, but in addition to being able to pass props whenever you mount one of these guys, after it's already mounted, um, you can say uh, set data, right? Um, and I think set prop data is uh, the one for props. And then, uh, yeah, you're literally just saying, hey, go set you know whatever this uh, this attribute is in data to this, and then I want to say, oh, okay, well, then uh, that should be equal to foo. Then it is. Uh, and then events and async. Yeah, again, nothing new with uh, with what you're seeing, Just I don't think. No, not yet. Uh, so, events. Switch. Oh, no, it didn't. Duh, because I have a stash. There we go. I didn't stash my git changes, so my switching of branches did not actually happen. Ah, which is why I didn't see the photo I was looking for. There we go. All right, so Evan didn't write this one. I wrote this one. Big fancy. All right, so this one actually does add functionality to the app. Oh, that's right. There's a... Does that. So I have a click handler here, calls add item, and uh, the way that I'm doing this is I'm communicating that to the parent through emitting an event. And so since I'm not manipulating data here, I need to test what my output is, because that's what I care about. That's my contract. All right, so again, most of this is uh, stuff that you've already seen. Uh, so we have this input. Uh, this is a convenience for setting the value of an input that we also get from view test utils. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and add uh, list item three, and then I'm going to click on it. And then I'm going to do a couple of tests. So again, we have a wrapper or instance of utils, view test utils. Uh, emitted is a convenience method that will literally return all the emitted events that happened while you were running things above this line. And uh, you can just uh, call it by, by attribute at that point. So I want add item and I'm going to say, hey, this should have a length of one. And then I got a little bit more specific in this one and I said, hey, I also want to know that it's actually this and not maybe something else. Yeah, it works.
right? Yeah, so if you're wrong, you'll see uh, that what you actually had was one. Um, it's double nested. And uh, to have the, the message was, let's see it. Yeah, it's probably just because it failed on the first one. Yeah, there you go. Cool. Uh, and if you go into the view test utils guide, like they show you how to do keyboard events and all that other kind of stuff. But I mean, once you know how to do one kind of event, doing the others is just kind of like, all right, what's all right? What are the codes for a keyboard uh, or for keys and all that kind of stuff? Um, but it's pretty much the same. The component itself, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, this is my, yeah, that's my contract with the parent or whoever use, uses me, right? So as far as I'm concerned, since that's really my output, I'm not manipulating data, I just want to make sure, hey, you know, I expect that this should be the output, you do what you want with it. Uh, so that's events. We have async. All right, so for this, wrong browser instance. OK, different port because now all of a sudden I had to install Express and Axios and compile my Webpack config and uh, Express and all the good things just so that I could uh, make a call to a server and show you guys how to mock it. So what I did is I added this little guy who's just a button who just makes a call to a server and gets back a string. So Oh, message toggle. All right. What's that? Actually, no, sorry. That's not it. Where's my? It's in the what? Um, I swear I did this in a child component, and then, all right, well, whatever. Maybe I did at one point and changed my mind or something like that. Anyway, so so we're back up in our, uh, our root component, obviously now bringing in uh, Axios so we can make our call. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's dead simple. Um, I'm going to call this function down here, where... We have this nice pretty syntax with async await, and I'm going to uh, go and call for this message. This returns me a string, and then I'm just going to set uh, I'm going to set my uh, data attribute. Isn't that what I did? Yeah, uh, to the to the return of that. Yeah, so again, same stuff here. Uh, importing flush promises. Uh, when you go through the guide, they'll show you how to 
uh, how to deal with promises or async await using next tick. I just don't like the syntax as well, so I just use this, which they also show you. Okay, cool. So it gets a message from the server when the button is clicked, right? So I go find my button and click on him, and then uh, I need to await uh, the uh, flush promises, which, uh, yeah, you just import it up there and you just do await flush promises and it does exactly what it says. Uh, and then here, you can see that I'm saying wrapper.vm. So VM is a reference to, oh, now I want to go directly to the real component, right? So if I want to access uh, data attribute like that, I can do it simply by walking over to the component and asking for it. And then I say it should be my value. But how do you know that? Because highlighting this, it's not in there. Aha, uh -huh. so, um, yeah, so this is a convention of just, uh, you have a under, under, mox, under, under, and then uh, you give it a, the name of whatever you're saying here. So you say just.mock, give it a name, and it just literally does a string match to whatever uh, is before the first dot in your file name. And uh, you see this, so I'm gonna say, well, this is gonna be a get. Uh, I need to actually have a promise, and then on the resolve, it's going to give me back uh, data, which of course that's what Axios does uh, or uses is the the data attribute, and then it'll be mock value. So that part's not one hundred percent declarative, but not everything in view is, and so yeah, so it should be that. I was like, as soon as I switched to that last Git branch, and now I got to switch over to using uh, the uh, Express and Axios and everything, I was like, oh, yeah, it's going to fall apart at that point. And it didn't. Um, yeah, so we can go in a couple of places and verify it. We don't have a false positive or negative, however you might say that. Yeah, so we see the bar. So that's how you mock async stuff. What do we have left? I think a whole lot. Yeah, I think I covered all the all the things that I want to. There are other things um, that Vue test utils gets into, like how to do Vuex, plugins, mix-ins, all that. And I was like, oh god, yeah, that'll be like a talk in and of itself, just doing like the Vuex one or like the the plugins or the mix-ins one. Um, doing mixins is a little bit contentious, I guess, these yeah. days anyway, yeah. so, yeah. Um, so anyway, that's, that's, that's enough to, I think, to, to really get going. If you did all that, you'd have most of your basics covered for your unit, your unit tests and your snapshots. Um, stuff to check out. I think that's my last slide. So yeah, so Ed Gerber. Um, this is uh, uh, GitHub link. I uh, got his view conf talk on there, uh, the book, which you can actually read for free online, at least for now. Um, and yeah, he's core contributor to Vue.js, Vue Utils, Vue.js, and I don't remember what all else, a bunch. Um, I believe he's from London. He is from London. He works for the BBC. He gave a talk at the Vue conference, and you really should watch it. It's really awesome. It was actually one of the better talks. Interesting. Cool. Um, yeah, so a couple of other articles that I found uh, very useful uh, was Kent Dodd's migration to Jest. Uh, I don't remember off the top of my head what he was migrating from, but uh, I think it was 
Kerma or Jasmine or something like that. Uh, yeah, and he lists his accounts and what he went through and was it worth it and you know what are the advantages that he found and everything. And then Vitaly Zidon's uh, overview of testing in 2018, which is one of the links I had on a prior page. Uh, and he really gets into Yes. No. Come here. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, we'll go through the yeah, TLDR use use Jest and Test Cafe. Uh, yeah, he really he really does get into it. Um, he talks all about like the different types of tests, the different tools. This was I thought this was a really neat breakdown because it kind of shows you with all the popular libraries, like here's what this one does and doesn't do, more or less, kind of like a matrix. I love matrices. Um, yeah, a bunch of stuff. And then he goes into the specifics on uh, on the different libraries and how to do stuff uh, with them. And there's a pretty active comments section at the bottom as well. Uh, what else? Yeah, and there's the, the view test utils guide. And uh, a number of other libraries, obviously, use like Axios and Express and all the things. Um, that weren't specific to testing, but uh, I can provide links to all the different things that I use if anybody's interested. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Questions? Thanks for doing that. Thanks for live coding. That's always a scary proposition, which is why I want to do it. Well, live I'm commenting. <laughs> so uh, I just want to mention, remind everybody that the uh, June 28th um, will be the Code Labs Round 2 at Politico. Um, and then the July 11th is a um, tentative talk with Jacob Schatz, or Schatz, or how he says his last name, about UX. And um, that we have a website, UGC.io, and we also have a Discord channel. And all the information is there. And I hope I. So thanks everybody for coming. We appreciate it. We we'll hope to see you next time. Do you have anything? Anybody have any questions? Yeah, for questions. Time? Yeah, because I know everything about this. <laughs> I'm curious to hear about the challenges that you had that you have been able to solve and how you solved it. Specific to testing? Yes. Dang, I thought it was going to be. Fun. Like I was like, oh my god, tell me it can be about anything. <laughs> Because then I would get into what I think is actually the hardest thing about programming, and it's not the two things that, what's his name that says uh, deleting cache and naming things? Yeah, those are actually pretty difficult. They come up all the time. Actually, I think the most difficult thing uh, oftentimes is people. But <laughs> all the people who know me are like, yep. Um, challenges, challenges with making this thing, uh, Probably the most challenging thing was remembering how to set up uh, Express with Webpack, you know, on a sort of a CLI-based app because I haven't done that in forever, and you know, I spend my days knee-deep in an extremely ugly Rails for almost five app and integrating Vue into that and all all the things. So I'm really well versed at all these really complicated advanced things, and it's like, wait, how do I do the basic stuff again? Kayla would know; she went through the school recently that <laughs> that goes over all that stuff. Um, that, uh, ah, I know one, uh, here, I could actually show it to you and it's, it's in this project. Uh, I just didn't have the time, didn't take the time, however you want to look at that, uh, to figure out how to solve this. I probably will because I'm curious. I think it's in. You guys can see this better f than me. Look for an emit, a dollar emit in the template. Uh, nah, it won't be in there. It's in one of the lower ones. Ah, there it is. Okay. Oh, is this the whole event thing? Yeah, this is what we were talking about earlier. Well, okay, so it's not the thing that Henry. Uh, see, I got it right, Henry. Yeah, it's not quite the thing we were talking about before, but okay. So what's going on here is in the add item button component, 
which is a child of this, and this is a child of app. So a grandchild of app is actually where the stuff's happening. That's where the, the user's clicking and stuff. Uh, but I, where I need to uh, manipulate my data is always in the root component, right? Or, or well, in whatever you're calling sort of your, your root component, or your, your traffic cop or, or whatever. But, uh, but that's where I want to do it. And so I was like, well, I want to make it its own component, you know, so I'm just not always tacking on to the same one. And I'm like, oh, well, basically I need to do event forwarding or whatever the proper term is for this, where I'm basically just re-emitting the same event on the, under the same name, uh, kind of like inverse recursion or something like that. And so uh, what I didn't find was readily available uh, a use case for being able to simulate an event that really came from the child that you're just forwarding on. And so I spent about 10 minutes messing around with it, and I'm like, yeah, it doesn't really add much. Like, it doesn't actually cover a basic point that I didn't already cover. And I don't know if this is an edge case or not, but it is something that I plan to figure out how to solve. Um, and if I do, I guess I could post in uh, meetup comments or something like that. Uh, but this was one that was was challenging. And no, I didn't I didn't figure it out in time to, to show you guys. But and if somebody beats me to the punch, email me. Um, Yeah, um, what else? I guess knowing, like knowing what to test, yeah. what to look for, I think that's kind of, right? Because if you don't know what to test for, it doesn't matter if you have every line covered. If you're not looking for the right things, you can still have bugs. Um, yeah, I, I would say that, that, that that's definitely one of them, is knowing like, okay, well, say you have a much more complicated component, how much of it do I really need to test for? Like, for example, today, I, was, uh, you know, I went from zero to 60 on uh, that date picker component, but it uses a third party uh, component in there. Um, fortunately, I'm not allowed to show you, even though it's on this computer, but, um, but yeah, so I'm using this third party component, right, but I need to test that, uh, that when a user clicks on something that's going to be there because I have logic that runs off of that, you know, I, I think that the right thing to do is actually to simulate that. Well, now I'm, I'm partially testing something that this third party component does that should already be tested. Um, so that's kind of one of those where, you know, if you start testing things that are actually core view stuff, like, isn't that already tested? So, uh, that's just one example. Um, yeah, another one is, uh, here's one. Uh, in fact, I ran into this today. Same thing, third party component that I'm borrowing. And what's like the first thing you do when it's a UI component is you're overriding styles. Don't get Tracy started on that. Um, but because time was of the essence, rather than rewrite a deep picker myself, I just uh, went with a third party one. But then again, of course, I needed to change the styles. But when I'm clicking around and class names are changing and, and I need to test that, you know, whatever, now they clicked on it, so now all of a sudden I should have this date value, this some string, I actually need to look for the specific class that this author wrote or whatever, so I mean that's what I'm using because he doesn't have an API for here, change the class name because functionally you don't really need to. But there I am writing a test where I literally have the name of his class that he wrote right in my test. So that's one where I think if you go very far down that path, all of a sudden now you've got your tests getting more and more coupled to the specifics of an implementation when to be honest, you don't really care what the class is. You really just care about what was based on this you know, whatever the user did, uh, this should be my output. You know, and maybe the answer is walk the DOM or do some, uh, you know, some better uh, select or searching or something like that. But I feel like that can get kind of brittle too, right? Because what happens if you're like, oh, okay, yeah, let's not, let's not base this on selector names because those, those could change or they'd be third party or whatever. And by the way, they do. Um, the third, uh, third party authors will change them. I've had that happen before. Um, is okay, yeah, so let's, you know, let's set up our selectors kind of like you do in uh, Selenium tests sometimes. 
But if you have a whole bunch of those and, and those are fairly specific and then you start changing, you know, like all of a sudden now you got to change the way this component looks or whatever because you got new requirements. Well, if that changes the structure of your DOM, now all those tests are subject to breakage, right? And so now you got to go figure out, okay, well, what's the DOM path now? So that could be a little bit of tedium or brittleness that you might, you know, wind up having in the test. Um, maybe refs. Uh, all of you, you know, refs is maybe uh, like a decent answer where they can be used because then you're you're saying, no matter what else, I have a ref on there and I can, you know, and I can really hang on to that. Although then it's kind of like, well, but if the only reason you're putting a ref in your actual component is so that it makes it easier to test, that almost kind of gets in there to, uh, like if you have too much, uh, too much functionality going on and say private methods in some class or some controller like for Rails or whatever, um, you know, and, and you're trying to test your output, but you're having to mock and stub the crap out of stuff because you've got all this extra functionality going along that, going on that you can't directly test because it's private and you shouldn't, even though Ruby will let you. Um, I don't know. I, I feel like it's just easy to go down a number of slippery slopes. So, yeah, when it comes to challenges, that's, those are some challenges that I face. So, if anybody has awesome creative answers for those, let me know. Yeah, true that. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. Just also can do auto mocking, but I haven't used it yet because I didn't. Oh, I have. It's nice. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, is there anything worth mentioning in just.config? Uh, oh, yeah. We haven't really looked at that. Um, and, and yeah, I think it is. So if we go to my package JSON, the way I did this, because I like to keep my package JSON relatively clean. Um, oh, yeah, Evan, you look at that. Uh, yeah, so what I did here, I mean, you can put your entire config in uh, uh, the package.json, and maybe this is what you're getting at. Uh, as soon as I started doing that, I was like, oh, heck no. Yeah, no, no. Um, but yeah, so it just says, uh, just say, just patch dash dash config and give it, uh, give it a file name that corresponds with that, or I think one other one. And then, thank you. Yeah, and it's just, just a JavaScript module. So I've got like verbose true on, obviously for the purposes of something like this. Uh, module file extensions. So what all kinds of modules do I want it um, to be able to work with? Uh, module name wrapper, uh, this gets into the whole you can use at and blah, blah, blah. Um, the transformation stuff, so BabelJS, that'll give you like all your ES6 stuff. And then the Vue.js, that's what gives you, like whether you're in the template or you're, uh, well, you wouldn't be in the styles, but um, unless you had like a compiler. No, I don't, I don't think you'd get that. Um, but at any rate, at least in the template and the JavaScript, uh, you get nice pretty output. Uh, and yeah, the snapshot serializers deal. Um, 
there's a lot of other options that I didn't really explore. That I just didn't feel like they were necessary to get like basics across. As I was like, well, I could go really in depth in certain things, and I know a fool. Like people come out, and then like by tomorrow, they'll remember like five percent of like what I said. Um, but yeah, there there actually is quite a bit, um, quite a bit in there. Yeah, they really are. I mean, I think I started using Jest last week <laughs> or something like that. I mean, I've used a lot of other libraries, so that, that helps. But, um, but yeah, there's a lot of stuff that, uh, that you can do here. You can even get into customizing the parallelization that it'll do and assigning workers and all this kind of stuff that I have not even begun to delve into. Uh, globals and global setup. Uh, one thing I thought about doing, but just really didn't get the time, was trying to use uh, its globals object to set up uh, the word context. Just like you can use describe and it and test and, and all that kind of stuff. You don't have to do imports every single time or have some finagled scheme where you're really doing that anyway. Um, that, of course, would not be declarative. Uh, I just hadn't gotten the time to do that. But context is one. So anybody coming from uh, like the R spec world, uh, it's really just an alias for describe. But it's kind of tips you off to intent. Like my intent is this is a different context. State or something like that is different and now all these tests are running under this different state, if you will, um, as opposed to describe all the time. So that was something that I thought would be pretty cool. Yeah, apparently there is tons you can do with it that I just haven't messed with yet. Any other questions? Oh. Um, and on your examples, you use uh, Shalom. Yes, sir. Are there any um, situations where you find yourself reaching for uh, full mount? Uh, yes. Once we get this disconnected from here, uh, we can sit one on one, and I can show you. It's work stuff, so I can't have it recorded, and I can't like broadcast it or whatever. But you know, if you're my buddy, I'm just meeting for a beer. But, yeah, it's a, a little bit different. But yeah, I can I can show you uh, a bit where I did do that. That's in the docs. I'm assuming. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and literally the difference is you either mount the child components or you don't mount the child components. Um, but there was there is a case where I did that. I'm guessing there's probably a way through mocking that I could not do that, but it was I needed to get something done today because my manager was catching a lot of heat for the fact that I'm beating the New York team to the punch and getting what pack and view in their code base, and <laughs> there are 11 million kinds of pissed off at me because <laughs> everything works. Um, so, yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, I, I can show you like a brief example of, of what I did with that. Cool. Yeah. Thank you all for coming. We'll see you on June 28th. Awesome. Thanks, guys.